Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our research seminar series. Our speaker today is Jonathan Boodle. Jonathan is a cryptography researcher in the Foundational Cryptography Group at IBM Research in Zurich. He is currently working on efficient zero-knowledge proofs, especially those based on lattice assumptions or error-correcting codes. He received his PhD from University College London and was a postdoc at UC Berkeley, as well as IBM Research Zurich. Jonathan, it's great to have you. The floor is yours. Oh, great. Well, uh, thanks very much. It's always nice to meet another Jonathan. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, some work that we did on linear time zero knowledge succinct arguments. Um, so the material in this talk is actually based on two papers. Um, the first one's with Alessandro Chiesa and Jens Groff, and that one appeared at uh, TCC 2020. And then the second one is with Alessandro Chiesa and Sichi Lu. And, um, that's not appeared at the conference yet, but you can find that one online if you're interested. Um, oh, so um, yeah, just in case, um, just in case uh, there's something you don't understand, um, like Jonathan said, like, feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I also live quite near a train track, so uh, if the noise of trains is too much, then um, please just ask me to repeat myself. Okay, so. Um, this talk is about constructing zero knowledge proofs and arguments. So um, we've got to start by talking about what a zero knowledge proof is. Um, in a zero knowledge proof, we've got two parties, a prover and a verifier. And the prover wants to convince a verifier that some kind of statement is true. Um, in this case, we've got an instance, which is um, some kind of circuit defined over a finite field. And the prover wants to convince the verifier that there's a, a valid witness um, a set of assignments to the wires of the circuit, which produce the right output. Um, and then we should have three properties from these zero knowledge proofs and arguments. Um, we should have completeness. So if the prover has a valid witness, then the verifier should always accept. Soundness. Um, if the witness is invalid, then the verifier should always reject. And we also want the zero knowledge property. Um, we want it to be the case that um, the prover's messages that they send to the verifier um, when trying to convince the verifier that this statement is true, um, shouldn't leak anything about the prover's secret witness. Um, so this is an interactive protocol between the prover and the verifier. Um, lots of computational work going on. And you can ask the question, just how much computational work does there have to be? Um, and how many messages does the prover have to send? If our instance is something like um, an n-gate arithmetic circuit over a finite field f, then maybe the best you could expect is that the, the prover has to do like a linear number of field operations, maybe a constant number of operations for each gate in the circuit. And the same for the verifier. Um, now they can't do better than that because um, it kind of makes sense that both of them actually have to read the circuit if they want to um, uh, perform a zero knowledge proof um, about this circuit. And then you could hope that the number of bits that the prover communicates to the verifier in order to convince them as part of this protocol could be polylogarithmic in n, the number of gates in the circuit. Um, so maybe this would be something optimal that we could hope for, like a zero knowledge proof with op optimal computational complexity for the prover and the verifier. Um, now obviously, for applications, we don't want to verify with uh, you know, linear computational costs in the size of the um, in the size of the instance that they're trying to prove something about. So um, we, can, we can kind of relax this requirement a bit and so that the verifier doesn't have to read the entire circuit by themselves, uh, we can introduce some kind of pre-processing party, some kind of indexer who does a linear amount of work for the verifier and then maybe gives the verifier some kind of short hint um, to help them continue with the proof. And then maybe, maybe in this setting with some pre-processing, we could hope that the verifier does a polylogarithmic number of field operations. So this would be like some kind of some kind of holy grail result for uh, for zero knowledge. Um, somehow maybe this is what we maybe this is what we could hope for for you know some kind of best possible optimal um, um, zero knowledge proofs with like the best possible computational complexity for the prover and the verifier. Um, so just to just to really labor the point here um, about what O of n field operations for the prover and verifier actually means, um, if the original computation that the prover and verifier are going to um, uh, are going to operate on 
is this n-gate arithmetic circuit that's computable in n field operations. And then um, values like this, so um, you know, n with some like tiny poly logarithmic overhead, that number of field operations, or you know, if we have a security parameter lambda, um, some kind of tiny overhead in the security parameter lambda, neither of these counters O of n field operations um, will only allow um, prove and verify computational complexity like this O of n, maybe with some additive overhead of, um, of lambda in the security parameter. Um, because after all, it would be it would be a bit weird if the computational complexity for the prover and the verifier didn't depend at all on the the security that we wanted to achieve. Um, but this is really what I mean by um, linear number of field operations for the prover and verifier um, O of n field operations for the rest of the talk. Okay, so. Why is this actually important to um, you know to to achieve such like tight requirements on the on the prover for a zero knowledge proof? Well, just imagine if you were trying to to outsource some kind of large computation. Um, the verifier has some data, and they give the prover some data and some money, and the prover is going to um, perform maybe some kind of massive statistical analysis on the data, and then um, of course um, the verifier is outsourcing the computation, so there's no way they can check. The, the prover's analysis for themselves. So um, they also have to receive a, a proof from the prover that the statistical analysis was, was performed correctly. Um, so this is maybe some kind of outsourced computation setting that you can imagine. Now, the trouble is, of course, as the amount of data the verifier has goes up, then the cost of analyzing the data goes up too. And then there's, a, there's an additional cost for the prover to produce this proof that they actually did the, the computation that the verifier wanted correctly. Um, so if we have any kinds of overhead in the, um, in the prover complexity for the zero knowledge proofs, then there's going to be a big gap between, um, between what the prover can, can actually prove that they did to the verifier and, um, and the types of um, you know, computational tasks they might actually be able to you know, produce for the verifier. So this is a this is a big problem because um, uh, it's a bit it's a bit pointless to um, to perform the statistical analysis or something um, without a proof that you did it correctly. The verifier's got no way of telling whether that's correct at all. So for these applications, it's kind of important that we get some kind of linear prover cost uh, with overhead which is as low as possible to try and reduce the gap between um, between computing something and um, and proving something. So. Unfortunately, the reasons that, that prior works don't actually manage to achieve these kinds of requirements is because they use things like fast Fourier transforms to multiply um, big polynomials, um, which are made up of the, the wire values for the arithmetic circuit. And that has a logarithmic overhead. Um, on the other hand, many different zero knowledge proofs and arguments are computing algebraic commitments using things like uh, Pedersen commitments. And then um, if you have to perform a linear number of group exponentiations, well, that's actually O of lambda times n field operations. So that's not really linear time either. And then although there are all kinds of, uh, you know, excellent, really, really good, concretely efficient um, works um, that, that make some progress towards, uh, you know, eliminating fast Fourier transforms from the prover algorithms, um, more often than not, they still rely on um, like a linear number of group exponentiations. So they fail to, to match these, um, these really strict computational requirements that we set out in the intro. So basically motivated by this, like some of our favorite tools for producing zero knowledge proofs, commitments and fast Fourier transforms, um, we have to really cut down on these. Um, uh, we, we have to avoid using things which will give us any kind of computational overhead. Now, there is one prior construction of like a zero knowledge proof system, um, which, which does achieve these, these good requirements for computational overhead. And, um, and this is based on like um, producing an information theoretic argument called an interactive oracle proof. And then um, using a special hash function uh, with constant computational overhead to um, to get a cryptographic argument with like uh, you know good computational complexity for the indexer and the prover as described. Unfortunately, the drawback of this argument is that the verifier complexity is still like a square root in the size of the circuit. 
and the proof size is still a square root in the size of the circuit as well. Um, so actually, we can try it. We, we want to do much better than this. Um, but the underlying strategy is a good one. Produce an information theoretic zero knowledge protocol and then use this special hashing strategy using these hash functions to get a cryptographic argument. So our question becomes, can we construct linear time interactive oracle proofs, information theoretic protocols with better query complexity and verify complexity? Because those are kind of directly related to the, um, the parameters of the zero knowledge argument in the end. Um, so that's kind of some, some sort of intro or, or setup for the talk. Um, um, so next I'll go on to talk a little bit about the, you know, the overall strategy that we use um, to come up with our construction. Oh, I think there might be a question in the chat. Can you summarize what an IOP is? Um, uh, I can, don't worry, that's coming up in, uh, in just, a, just a few slides time, I think. In fact, you know, let me skip forward a bit and I can talk about, um, I could talk about what an IOP is and then um, I'll kind of zip back in my slides and then I'll talk about what our results are. So an interactive Oracle proof is like, um, like a special information theoretic zero knowledge proof protocol between a prover and a verifier. And in this protocol, the prover is sending these proof oracles to the verifier. And you can think of these as being like um, committed data um, with the role of the cryptographic commitment scheme kind of abstracted out. And then the verifier is allowed to make um, queries to these proof oracles and maybe discover some information about, um, about the data in the proof oracle. So you can think of the answers to the queries that the verifier makes as like openings to the, the cryptographic commitments. So the, these can be interactive protocols. So um, the prover can send lots of proof oracles. The verifier can respond with um, different messages over like several rounds of interactions. Um, and then there are different query types that we might consider. So um, we've got point queries um, in which the verifier can look at individual positions of these proof oracles. Um, there are tensor queries in which the verifier might ask for like special linear combinations of data in the proof oracles. And these are obviously a special case of linear queries where the verifier just asks for kind of arbitrary linear combinations of data in the proof oracles. Um, so that's what an IOP is. It's kind of an abstract information theoretic zero knowledge protocol where you don't really have to worry about how data is, um, is committed too much. Um, just, uh, you just get to think about um, the kinds of queries that the verifier makes to, this, to the committed data and what kind of computations they can do and deduce based on those. Um, so now let me, uh, let me rewind a little bit. I can talk about our results. Okay, so um, we, construct, we construct IOP protocols um, with uh, you know, linear index or improver complexity. And actually in, um, in the first piece of work that I mentioned on the title slide, we get a uh, sublinear verified complexity and sublinear query complexity. So, you know, in the circuit size, you can have um, proof size, which is like square root or cube root or fourth root or whatever you want, really. Um, but it's not zero knowledge. And then in the second piece of work, we actually improve this to get a um, polylogarithmic verified complexity and uh, logarithmic query complexity. Um, and the protocol has zero knowledge too. So then if you follow like this, um, this similar hashing strategy that was used before, um, then you can get real um, cryptographic arguments with like uh, similar properties. Um, and uh, in particular, the, um, the argument system that we get from uh, paper number two fulfills all the requirements that I set out at the start of the talk. Um, there are a few small caveats. So um, the verifier complexity is still uh, polylogarithmic. Obviously, um, instead of having a polynomial there, it would be nice to have that um, just purely logarithmic. Um, the number of queries that the, the verifier has to make as part of the IOP. And typically, if we reduce the number of queries, we have a more efficient argument too. So instead of a logarithmic number of queries, we could aim for like a constant number of queries from the verifier. And uh, you know, lastly, another limitation is that um, these protocols that we've designed only work over finite fields with at least n elements. So, um, you know, if you have a big field, like a cryptographically large field, the kind that you might use for elliptic curve cryptography or something, then this is going to give you a perfectly good argument system in the end. But uh, if you wanted to prove stuff about binary values mod two, 
then um, then you would have some problems. You might have to um, you know embed those values into a larger field. Um, so uh, so you know that's another limitation that we might work on in the future. Um, now recently, um, building on paper number one, um, there's actually a new construction of uh, you know uh, linear time zero knowledge arguments. Um, these are likely to be a bit more efficient than ours in practice, um, but they do rely on some uh, some some assumptions about uh, how you can um, how you can prove things about proofs which use uh, random oracles. So there's a few hur heuristics going on there, but um, this one is definitely likely to be to be more efficient than um, our protocol number two. Okay, so. Um, so now I'm ready to give you kind of an overview of our um, technical approach. Um, so we've seen interactive Oracle proofs. Um, we know that um, this is a protocol where the verifier can make, you know, maybe we have point queries or tensor queries or, or linear queries. Um, now, since the IOPs we produce um, as part of our results are going to be point query IOPs, then I'm just going to briefly explain how to turn those into cryptographic arguments. So we have, um, we have proof messages sent by the prover. The verifier is supposed to be able to query any individual points of these. How do we turn this into a cryptographic argument? Well, so what we do is whenever the prover was supposed to send a proof oracle to the verifier, instead the prover can hash their proof oracle up into uh, like a single Merkle root using a Merkle tree then whenever the verifier wants to see like an individual position of, um, of the prover's proof data, they can just ask the prover to send it to them, um, the answer along with some Merkle paths, which kind of authenticate the, the answer and show that it's really um, part of the proof data that was hashed up into the Merkle root. And, um, and then the structure of the protocol just exactly mirrors the, um, the point query IOP that we started from. Um, and then, uh, you know, a nice feature of this is because um, because the the protocol we started with is just completely information theoretic and abstract, and because we've just used hash functions, whatever cryptographic arguments we construct in this way, um, most likely they're secure against quantum computers in the future. Um, so that's a nice plus from using this strategy. Um, okay, so um, our approach. Um, is actually going to be to construct um, a couple of different types of IOPs and then you know convert from one to another. So um, here's what we do. We're going to start with a tensor query IOP in which the verifier makes these tensor queries. Um, now using a linear error correcting code, um, we've got a method of compiling tensor query IOPs using some kind of consistency test. Um, and then the output of the compiler is going to be a point query IOP with um, kind of sublinear verify complexity and sublinear query complexity. Um, so we've got an input IOP, a code, and then we'll get an output IOP. And um, this is what happens in paper number one. So the important thing here is that if we start with a tensor query IOP, which has like good properties, so you know um, a linear prover time, for example and uh, sublinear verifier time. And then if we have an error correcting code where encoding using the error correcting code doesn't cost too much, maybe an overhead of, um, of theta, then basically the same overheads for the error correcting code just kind of get transferred into the prover time and the verifier time in like the resulting sublinear point query IOP um, after compiling. Um, so this is what happens in paper number one and how we construct the sublinear point query IOP there um, and how we, how we get those sublinear cryptographic arguments. Okay, now in paper number two, we make some improvements. So um, actually the bottleneck, the reason that we only achieve like a sublinear verify complexity, not something logarithmic, is um, because of the consistency test that we use. So we keep the same tensor query IOP and like a similar approach with error correcting codes, but we kind of improve this consistency test a bit for our compiler. So um, we actually use some fancy proof composition techniques, um, you know, composing with some, some other protocols from the literature, um, some uh, probabilistically checkable proofs with nice properties. Um, this gives us a better consistency test. 
Um, and um, another thing we show is that um, if we add zero knowledge to all the components, so the tensor query IOP, if we add some kind of zero knowledge property to these error correcting codes, then the output IOP, point query IOP is going to be zero knowledge as well. So those are the improvements that we make in the, in the second paper. Um, so efficiency wise, um, the input IOP, the tensor query IOP is kind of the same as before. The um, linear error correcting code is kind of similar to before. Um, now the difference is because we've switched to this new consistency test, uh, we get a polylogarithmic verifier and a logarithmic number of point queries. Um, so, uh, you know, I mentioned um, I mentioned the places where hash functions were used before at the at the very end to turn the point query IOP into a cryptographic argument. I just want to kind of stress again that um, you know the only place where cryptography is actually used in this recipe. Um, is at the very end um, in that place to turn the point query IOP into a cryptographic argument. Um, you know, in designing this uh, tensor query IOP, in designing the error correcting codes, um, the compiler, um, there's actually no cryptography there at all, um, which is kind of impressive if you stop to think about it. So, um, you know, most of the, um, basically most of the nice properties of this proof system we've come up with um, actually come from, you know, algebra and um, maybe some facts about probability and combinatorics. Um, so it's not, it's not so much like maybe other areas where, you know, something like uh, indistinguishability obfuscation or some complex cryptographic tool, like suddenly gives you loads of power. Um, here, the cryptography is really just some, some hash functions at the end, which I think is quite neat. All right, so um, in terms of related techniques, um, there's lots of prior work on uh, linear time interactive proofs, which are kind of closely related to, to our work. Um, lots of work on pre-processing arguments as well, um, which we draw on. And um, lastly, there are lots of prior works on code-based IOPs, and these either give like um, interesting code-based compilers with useful properties, or um, they give you know interesting clues about how to construct a consistency test. So we draw on aspects of all these things in uh, in papers one and two. Okay, so now I'm going to talk just a little bit about how we construct these um, these tensor query IOPs. Um, so you know at least conceptually, um, it's actually quite easy. Lots of zero knowledge protocols use the, um, the sum check protocol, which is from a paper in uh, 2008. And um, in that protocol, we have this kind of polynomial function of the witness, a low degree extension, like an, a special encoding that the prover sends to the verifier. And then the verifier gets to look at the low degree extension at different points. And um, it's, been, it's been shown in different works. So um, in this 2013 work or 2019 work on the slide, that you can design kind of linear time sum check protocols, um, which let you check arithmetic circuit satisfiability in um, you know in linear time for the prover, um, which is great. So you can check all kinds of complex statements. Um, so um, you know this is a nice ingredient to start with, um, but we need to use this to get a, a tensor query IOP. Um, and there's this nice observation from um, from a, a recent work in 2020 that says. Um, so if you look at this expression at the bottom of the slide for like um, a particular point of this like low degree extension of the witness, then actually you can rephrase it uh, as a kind of tensor expression. So any point that the verifier might want to look at as part of the sum check protocol, they can actually get as a, um, a tensor query um, to a particular part of the witness, which is a really nice observation. So basically um, whenever, whenever you have like a protocol which uses the sum check protocol, you know, of which there are actually many, many zero knowledge protocols like that in the literature, um, you can turn it into a, um, a tensor query IOP where the verifier makes tensor queries to the witness. And, um, and we're going to have nice properties like, um, you know, linear time proving. And uh, we'll have a log polylogarithmic um, verification time as well. Um, so our contribution in, um, in paper number one was actually to, uh, to find a way to um, to make this work in our particular setting, um, allowing pre-processing. So then as well as the verifier having um, uh, access to the, the witness through queries, they also have kind of query access to the, um, the circuit description so that they don't have to read all of it. Um, and, um, and actually um, in paper number two, um, 
one of our contributions is to, to make this zero knowledge. Now, um, typical strategies for making the sum check protocol zero knowledge, um, you know, the naive way of doing things introduces, um, you know, some potential overhead. So we had to take some care in, um, in how we made the sum check protocol zero knowledge to get like a, a nice zero knowledge linear time uh, tensor query IOP. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about this um, really at a high level in case, uh, unless anybody has some, some more specific questions. Um, but uh, otherwise, if you've got any very deep questions, then uh, I think I'd refer you to the papers for the details. Okay, so um, let me go on. And now I'll talk about um, um, the code-based compiler techniques that we use in our paper. Um, so these come more from uh, paper number one. Um, so um, you've, you've had a whistle-stop tour of um, tensor query IOPs, and um, you have kind of an overview of how to construct those. But now, given a tensor query IOP, um, we want to turn it into a point query IOP. So we can use this, uh, this hashing strategy to get a cryptographic argument. So we've got a protocol in which the prover sends um, uh, uh, tensor IOP proof data to the verifier. The verifier can make tensor queries. We want a point query IOP. So what should we do? Well, what we do is um, we find a way to kind of, um, you know, simulate the, um, the tensor query IOP. So instead of, instead of actually sending the original messages, the proof is going to encode each message um, using a special error correcting code. And then um, instead of making tensor queries to those, then the verifier gets to make point queries. Now, whenever in the original protocol, the verifier wanted to make a tensor query, um, now, um, you know, the data for that is not available anymore. So the verif and the verifier can't make tensor queries. So what they do is they just send their tensor queries straight to the prover and the prover sends the answers to those queries kind of directly to the verifier. Um, so the kind of the flow here between the prover and the verifier just exactly matches what happened what happened before, except that um, instead of tensor IOP proof data, um, the prover sends encodings of all that data, and instead of making tensor queries directly, the um, the verifier asks those tensor queries to the prover. Um, so this is like a simulation of exactly what happened before. So notice that you know by by doing this uh, simulation of the, the tensor query IOP, um, we've actually introduced some new possibilities for the prover to cheat. So in particular, like one way that the prover might cheat is um, they might decide that they don't want to send um, like valid encodings of, um, of proof data using an error correcting code. They might just send like complete rubbish to the verifier. So um, we need some kind of consistency check um, which is going to check that all of the prover's messages are actually close to being valid encodings. Um, so another thing is that, um, so now the verifier is asking some of their tensor queries directly to the prover and the prover's got um, the, the freedom to respond with uh, whatever values they like. Um, they might not be valid answers to, to anything at all. So as, as part of um, you know, this, this consistency phase that we've got after the simulation phase, we also want to check that um, whatever query answers the prover sends directly to the verifier, they must be consistent with um, encode the, the encoded data that the prover's, that the prover's sent to the verifier. Um, so this seems like a tall order. Um, we've got to choose some encodings which preserve linear time. So, um, you know, obviously the prover is going to be producing all of this data and then encoding it. So um, this procedure better be, um, better be linear time for the prover too. Um, we need to be able to do this proximity test to check that um, all the encodings are close to code words. We need to do a consistency test to check that the tensor query answers are correct. Um, now we also need some kind of zero knowledge property from the encoding so that the verifier's queries don't, don't leak too much information. Um, so, um, so we need to think carefully about what type of encodings to choose. So, to try and motivate the, the types of encodings that we're going to choose, um, I'm going to talk about a, um, a folding operation on different pieces of data. So if you have, um, if you have like these three arrays, A1, A2, and A3, and we have uh, you know, a vector V giving a linear combination, then you can talk about folding up these three arrays with V 
by um, using the coefficients of v to take a linear combination of the three arrays. Um, so that's kind of nice and simple. And um, when I talk about folding, um, uh, is this kind of operation that I mean? Okay. So now, um, what we're going to do to um, to try and get some idea about which encoding scheme we should use um, to construct these proofs, we're going to look at how to compute the answers to tensor queries um, using this folding operation. So I'm going to arrange my, my proof data into some kind of cube. And then if I have a query, which is like Q1 tensor Q2 tensor Q3, then if I kind of fold along the, um, the Z axis there um, with this vector Q3, then I'll just get some kind of square array. And then I can fold kind of vertically along the Y axis with this other component Q2 from the linear combination. And then, uh, you know, I'll just get some kind of line segment. And then finally, I can fold that up along, um, um, along the final axis um, using this component Q1 of the linear combination. And, um, you know, if I do this repeated folding procedure, that's actually the same as, um, as the answer to the tensor query. Like if I, made, if I made the proof data into like a vector and I asked for this special linear combination, um, it's just a different way of computing the same thing. Um, so this might be a good point to pause and, um, and see if there are any more questions about like the, um, the strategy for turning a tensor IOP into like a point one by encoding, or uh, maybe some questions about this folding operation. Uh, I, I may have a question. I'm not sure I understood the folding procedure. Uh, so as you explained before, folding needs as many coefficients as the dimensions, right? So how, how do you fold these three vectors of dimension two using only Q3, which is a single element? Ah, okay, so um, so this is this is like a this is like a tensor um, it's like a tensor product. So um, let me just let me try and draw a picture on the see if I can draw a picture on the slide. Um, let's say um, let's say that the tensor IOP proof data is like um, two by two by two. Um, so we've got eight elements. Okay. Um, and then um, Q1, um, Q1 should be a vector with um, two elements, Q2 should be a vector with um, two elements, and Q3 should be a vector with um, two elements as well. Um, so kind of, um, if, um, if we kind of... Okay, I got it now. So th those yeah. are vectors as well. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense yeah. now. Oh, I okay, thought great. Q1, Q2, Q3, I... Two yeah. elements of a vector, yeah. 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 Nice. Thanks. Yeah. So then, um, if I made um, if I made these eight, if I made these eight into a long vector, and then um, I kind of um, I took the scalar product with um, q1, q2, and q3. Um, so what I'm saying is that we just that we get the the same answer in both cases. I see. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is like um, this is kind of some kind of like step by step recursive way of um, of computing the answer to a tensor query. Um, so this is actually going to motivate the the type of encoding scheme um, we're going to be able to use for our proofs. So yeah, if I can get to the next slide, so we've got an encoding of some uh, some tensor IOP proof data. Um, and we want to check consistency between the encoding and the um, the uh, the answer to um, a, a tensor query that the proof has just sent to the verifier. Um, so, which encoding should we choose? Now, we've got the um, we've got the proof data nicely arranged in a hypercube. So, maybe what we should do is like consider an encoding which kind of res respects the structure of this hypercube. So, if we have some kind of um, like linear error correcting code um, C. Um, then we could take all of the um, we could take all of the horizontal lines in this cube, and um, we can encode everything horizontally using the error correcting code, um, and then we could do the same vertically as well, um, and um, you know this kind of nicely respects this uh, this hypercube structure that we've set up for the tensor IOP proof data, and it gives us like a collection of code words in uh, in a tensor code um, c to the power t. 
Um, so this is the encoding scheme that we're going to use. Um, so what should the prover actually send to the verifier to let the verifier check um, that tensor query answers are consistent? Um, so actually, if I fill in the diagonal on this diagram, the prover's messages are going to be all these kind of diagonal elements, as well as the, the answer to the tensor query. And um, kind of the high level intuition be behind um, what happens in our compiler is the verifier is going to try and check consistency between all of these diagonal objects um, at every folding step. And um, so the, the folding operation on, on all of these different arrays actually commutes with um, you know, uh, an encoding operation using the error correcting code. So um, uh, for example, if you look at this uh, blue one, this blue rectangle at the bottom, um, we can encode that. And then we can fold um, you know, the, um, the green rectangle in the diagonal. And these are actually supposed to be equal because the two operations are supposed to commute. Um, and so the idea behind our test is that the verifier is going to check equality between these different arrays by encoding and folding. Now, this isn't quite the end of the story. Some of these arrays are quite big and um, we wouldn't want the verifier to you know, read all of, these, um, all of these messages that the prover sent. So actually what's going to happen is the verifier is going to make queries to you know, different stripes of these encoded arrays and then um, just encode, just do the encoding and folding operations to do these checks on just um, very small parts of these arrays. And um, it turns out that um, like uh, good distance properties of the error correcting code sort of guarantee that if um, two of these elements don't match up, then there are like a very large number of individual positions or stripes um, where, um, where the verifier could um, discover that two elements weren't equal and kind of catch out the prover there. Um, so that's the idea behind how this test works. Um, now this is kind of for checking consistency for uh, tensor queries. Um, I said we needed a proximity test too to check that uh, uh, the prover's encodings are actually close to being valid encodings of things. Um, but uh, it turns out the structure of the proximity test is actually very similar. Um, so I won't go into that too much here. Um, so now we can analyze this and um, we can see how this sort of leads to the, uh, the sublinear verifier complexity um, that we saw in paper number one. Um, well, first let's have a quick look at the prover complexity. So if we had like this three-dimensional array um, for the tensor IP proof data, if we're dealing with the circuit with uh, N gates, then um, you know, we would end up with like a linear amount of, um, of data in this hypercube. And we can arrange this with kind of equal side lengths for the cube, uh, cube root of n. Now, the encoding operations to produce like the biggest um, proof oracle um, for the IOP, um, these just cost the linear number of operations if we've chosen um, a good error correcting code C, which is linear time encodable. And there are some nice examples of such codes from uh, some, some prior work in 1996 or more recently in 2014. The folding operation, the first folding operation that the prover does to compute the tensor query also has uh, you know, a linear cost in the size of the circuit. And then after that, for all the remaining operations, the prover is dealing with smaller arrays, which are sublinear in the size of the circuit. And so uh, the cost of all these subsequent operations is not too much. Now, as for the, um, the query complexity and the verifier complexity, um, the verifier as part of our protocol only ever has to touch these uh, one-dimensional stripes of any individual array. So if the, if the original piece of proof data was arranged in a cube with side length, a cube root of n, then um, that's going to be the verifier complexity and, um, and the query complexity as well. So I've graphically, I've, I've tried to show you some, some details of our protocol um, in three dimensions, but actually our protocol will kind of generalize to uh, sort of any constant number of dimensions here. And, uh, and this is how we get sort of O of n to the epsilon verify complexity and, um, and query complexity um, in the first paper. Oh, question pop up in the chat. How hard is it to make the encoding and folding commute? Um, oh, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, 
Okay, so so luckily, um, luckily it's it's actually not difficult at all, um, and um, and this is really important for how our protocol works. So um, um, let's say um, let's say let's say that I kind of um, you know labeled this array with different indices, so I could label um, um, I could label like um, horizontally um, with index i and kind of vertically with index j and um, along the z-axis with index, index k. Um, so um, if I want to encode in this direction, oh yeah, so sorry, an individual, um, like any individual element of this array is just given by like some index i, j, k. So if I want to kind of encode in this direction, then um, encoding is like uh, linear combinations. Encoding horizontally is like, Linear combinations um, with respect to um, like i i indices, um, and now um, like here in this one, um, if I want to if I want to kind of fold in this direction, then we'd be taking more linear combinations with respect to j indices. Um, so um, because as part of the verify checks. Um, the folding operation and the encoding operation, they're kind of taking place with respect to, um, you know, different coordinate axes or different indices, then, um, um, then th that's why the, the two operations will commute quite easily. Um, so luckily for us, it was, um, um, it was easy to see that that was the case, but uh, yeah, it's, um, it's very important for the verification checks that this works. So um, um, yeah, it's, um, um, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very nice that we have this property. Okay, so um, the next section of the talk um, is actually going to be about um, proof composition techniques. Um, and this, this section of the talk, um, the intention was to talk about um, actually how, um, how we take the, um, the sublinear consistency test that you've just seen and turn it into something with like better verify complexity. Um, so let's see. Um, we've got a compiled point query IOP. And um, what we want to do is like um, compose this point query IOP with, um, with something else to, um, to reduce the number of um, queries that the verifier has to make. Um, now, actually, I think this is, um, I think, so this is an interesting part of our paper, but um, I think sort of the following section on zero knowledge codes is, um, is a bit more interesting. So I'm gonna whiz through this a bit and we can talk more about zero knowledge codes, but if anybody's more interested in this proof composition, then um, I can come back to it in more detail at the end. But um, the basic idea is that, um, uh, so as part of our proof, the verifier is gonna do some kind of computation to check whether they want to accept or reject the proof. And this involves like O of n to the epsilon amount of data and O of n to the epsilon queries. So the idea is instead, we'll kind of use another um, very nice um, IOP protocol from the literature um, to give a proof that actually whatever the verifier would have done in our original protocol um, to, um, to check um, if the verifier had actually done that computation, this new verifier V star will, will check whether the old verifier would have accepted or rejected, um, but using a very, a very small number, like a constant number of, um, of point queries. Um, and we can show that this doesn't mess up the, um, the prover complexity and it leads to the stated verify complexity. Um, but uh, I, think the, I think the stuff on error correcting codes is, um, is a lot more fun. So I'm going, to, um, I'm going to proceed forwards onto that, but um, you're welcome to ask me questions about this proof composition stuff later. Okay, so onto zero knowledge codes. Um, so we know as part of the protocol that the verifier is going to make um, uh, point queries to different types of tensor encodings and their encodings of um, you know, proof data, which was related to the prover's secret witness. So we don't want those to leak any information to the verifier. Um, in particular, if the verifier queries a stripe of this encoded array, then seeing this stripe actually shouldn't tell the verifier anything about um, the data that the prover encoded. Um, so how are we going to design such things for tensor encodings? Um, this seems like kind of a challenge. Actually, if you look at any normal error correcting code, 
um, not even just the tensor encoding, but just the normal linear code, um, they always seem to leak information about the message. So every entry of like a code word in an error correcting code is like a sum of different elements of the message. So they, they always leak information to the verifier. So the way that we fix this is actually by reserving part of the message for some uh, encoding randomness. And then if, for example, like here, the verifier were to query the first three entries of the code word, then um, somehow based on the way this encoding randomness comes up, it's sort of impossible for the verifier to add or subtract these code word entries to completely cancel out the randomness and learn something about the, um, the encoded messages. Um, so we want to design encoding schemes which incorporate some randomness in, in this way to, um, to hide the message completely. And our strategy is going to be to um, you know, study, um, study codes like this. And then um, uh, what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to show that there are some nice um, linear time encodable codes with the zero knowledge property, which are suitable for our construction. And then we'll show that um, actually when, when you end up with these tensor encodings, these are also going to hide information about the prover's messages. Okay. So the way we get at this is to define zero knowledge algebraically. So um, if you encode using an error correcting code, it's like multiplying the message and the randomness by, uh, um, by generator matrix that defines the code. And we can split this generator matrix into a message part and a randomness part um, and separate those two. And so when the verifier queried the first three entries in our graphic example on the board, the reason they couldn't learn any information, it turns out to be because um, um, it's related to um, you know, the rows of the randomness part of this generator matrix. Actually, it turns out that no non-zero linear combination of these first three rows is equal to zero. Um, and if that's the case, the verifier can never sort of cancel out the encoding randomness and learn something about the message from these first three entries. Um, so this kind of condition does appear in prior work, but in order to prove our results for uh, tensor encodings, we start by sharpening things up a bit. So if we look at the randomness part of the matrix, you can ask for um, you know, the linear combinations, which multiply by the randomness part on the left to give you zero. And um, we're gonna call this space uh, you know, DC. If uh, C was the original code, then each element of DC is kind of like a, a verifier strategy for canceling out the, um, the randomness used and uh, trying to learn something about the message in the error correcting code. So we know from prior work that if, um, if kind of no weight B linear combination of this randomness part of the matrix gives zero, then um, the message is protected as long as the verifier doesn't see more than B entries. Um, so we actually managed to strengthen this to an equivalence condition. So um, if this space DC has like a, a minimum non-zero linear, sorry, like a, a linear combination um, with like um, minimum number of non-zero entries, like a B plus one, um, then this means that, um, um, you know, uh, exactly B entries that the verifier sees are going to look uh, uniformly random and not leak any information at all um, about the prover's messages, but any B plus one um, might leak some information. So we've actually strengthened to this uniformly random condition, which is a bit stronger than not leaking any information. Um, we actually studied like a, a more, more of a zero knowledge type of property when the code word entries might not be uniformly random, but still don't leak too much information. And um, you can see the results there in, in our paper. Um, so, um, yeah, any, any questions about um, the, the ideas behind, uh, behind these zero knowledge codes and, and masking so far? Uh, I have a question. Like you said, it's very important that uh, code encoding commutes with folding. Is this zero knowledge um, add, add an, somehow uh, destroying this property or is it easy to fix it? How, uh... Oh, um... Okay, so that's, um, that's a really good question. And um, hopefully I can answer it in this slide. So um, um, what we had before is like, um, say, we had, um, say we had a piece of tensor IOP proof data like this and we encoded it using a tensor code. Um, now, um, basically what we end up doing is, um, oops, 
sorry, just lost my cursor. Okay. Um, what we end up doing is just um, reserving like a part of um, each message that the prover sends for like encoding randomness. So um, if this part, if this part like um, if this part without the um, dollar signs is the um, is the original data, then um, you know you can just pad all of the you can just pad all of the prover's messages with randomness. Um, and then, um, and then you'll get something which you can you can safely encode, um, and um, because we're still just encoding kind of horizontally and um, and vertically, just like before, except you know it's just that we've done this padding first. Then we still have this nice um, commuting property that we had before, um, so everything sort of works out quite nicely. Um, so um, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, this is quite a lot of padding with randomness that we do in the end. And there are there are kind of more efficient padding schemes, um, which might be possible, but they cause you know they cause a few problems with um, you know commuting um, between uh, you know encoding and folding. So um, there are probably ways to improve the efficiency of this, but um, you'd have to look quite a lot more carefully into the um, the inner workings of the compiler. Um, so. Our task is to um, to show that this tensor encoding um, actually has zero knowledge if the um, if the basic encoding scheme has a, a zero knowledge property. Um, so this DC space is kind of the special space which tells us all that we want to know about the zero knowledge properties of um, of the code, and we can actually visualize it as a as a subspace of um, of um, vectors of length n if n is like the length of code words. And it kind of looks like this. It kind of overlaps a bit with the um, the jewel of the error correcting code and a bit with the code itself. Um, but we can draw this picture. And actually, it turns out that highlighted in gray, um, um, we can actually, you know, you can see from this kind of diagram, but we can express um, this space, um, the space which controls the zero knowledge property of uh, the tensor product code um, in terms of the spaces um, for like um, the basic uh, error correcting code. And this lets us prove something about um, about this space for the tensor code, and it will let us um, deduce that the tensor code also has some zero knowledge property. So basically, um, if uh, B queries to the base code look uniformly random, then because we had um, this nice equivalence condition, we know this space DC has minimum distance uh, B plus one. Um, and using the structure you can see in this diagram on the right, um, we're actually able to show that um, uh, the tensor product space also has minimum distance B plus one, which means that up to B queries to the tensor code also look uniformly random. And then kind of uh, inductively, we can show that, you know, however many tensor products we take, we still preserve this, uh, this zero knowledge property. Um, so in the paper, we've got some, uh, uh, we've got some results for like different variants. So a variant without uniform randomness um, in this statement and uh, also some constructions of um, like uh, basic codes, um, basic code C to use in this tensor product, which have like the linear time encodable property, which is like so important for our, our results on, on prover time. Okay, so now it's time to wrap up the talk. Um, so here's a summary of our results. Um, what we did was to construct um, information theoretic point query IOP protocols with good prover complexity and um, you know, sublinear and then later polylogarithmic verifier complexity and query complexity. Um, uh, so we did this using the, um, some of the compiler techniques you've seen and um, we proved zero knowledge using the properties of some, some error correcting codes. Um, I'd say the biggest open problem um, which we're left with is actually to do something for uh, smaller size fields, fields which don't have um, more than n elements. So in particular, it will be wonderful to get some kind of linear time zero knowledge result for, um, you know, binary fields, just zeros and ones, um, which seems out of reach at present. Um, so thanks very much for, for listening. Here are some links to the papers if you're interested and um, happy to take any more questions. I have another question. So you say this is uh, inherited for fields. So what, what of the, which of the tools doesn't work for rings, for example, and what's the difficulty to adapt it? Rings. Okay. So, um, okay. I wonder if I said rings by accident at some point, because I'm 
Um, I've been thinking about rings recently, but um, uh, I can I think I can answer that question. So um, the um, you know the the error correcting codes that we have can be defined over rings or or even like um, uh, binary or um, Boolean fields. So there's no problem there. Um, and the, the properties of the compiler just rely on the distance properties of the code. So you can do that over very small fields and rings. Um, now the problem that you have is potentially in designing the, um, the tensor query IOP. So there we make use of um, we make use of facts. So for example, like um, um, so we use the fact that uh, like a, a polynomial of degree um, a polynomial of degree n has like um, um, at most a, a certain number of roots, and we use statements like the the Schwarz lemma about the probability of like randomly choosing um, the root of a polynomial from a finite field. So that's not so straightforward to adapt to rings. And, um, and it's kind of a major problem for the, um, the soundness error of our protocols um, because we have like very large degree polynomials like polynomials of degree N. And then um, uh, because we use things like the schwartz sippel lemma, um, we get a soundness error of N over the field size. Um, so it's kind of very difficult to, to see how one might adapt that to, um, to really small fields. Um, but probably there's a way to do it over rings if you um, if you choose appropriate rings and like define a, an appropriate property. So there's a question in the chat that I'll ask, which is, uh, do you get up to B queries to all tensor products or to each tensor product? Let's see. Um, let me just just sit back in the zip back in the slides a bit. Let me see. So uh, I think if I understand correctly, and um, the um, the person who asked the question may want to correct me, um, do you get um, B queries to um, each tensor product, or um, you know, are the B queries collectively considered to um, you know all the different tensor products, all of the different proof messages, um, or um, oh, let me see. Yeah, that was the question. Great. Um, so. Um, so yeah, there are um, you're allowed um, you're allowed B queries to um, to this top tensor encoding, and that won't le leak any information. Um, so um, so actually, um, if you made um, if you made if you made some more queries to this tensor encoding, um, which is actually like a folded up version, which is derived from the top one, um, you might learn more information. Um, so. Um, an important fact that we use in the paper is that um, the verifier only has to make like queries directly to this one. Um, I didn't go into it in the talk, but we actually employ some um, some extra masking techniques. Um, so we add some extra masks to um, you know this one, for example. Okay, um, so that when the verifier makes some um, queries to um, kind of these lower order ones, um, it doesn't leak any um, any additional information. Um, so yeah, the answer is um, B queries to each individual tensor code word, but we have to be very careful because um, some of the arrays depend on each other in like a non-trivial way. So, um, so we do some extra masking to take this into account. Jonathan, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to give this talk to us. Uh, our next talk is actually this Thursday, March 11th at 1700 UTC from Eduardo Saria Vasquez, who is a senior cryptographer for the Technology Innovation Institute. His talk will be on verifiable computation over rings. If you wanna hear about future talks on a regular basis, sign up for our mailing list in the footer at research.protocol.ai. I send out an email at the beginning of every month previewing what talks are coming up for that month. Thanks for joining everyone. We will see you next time.